wolf pack, the alpha male, is a big, creamy fawn animal whose kin still haunt the tundra of Canada's Northwest Territories. His name is Shawano. The darker, oldest female is Bridget. She is no longer Shawano's mate, but plays a leading role in our incredible story. The 13-year film history of a single captive wolf pack. A true story told with unusual insight and affection for a magnificent but often misunderstood animal by Canadian author-naturalist R.D. Lawrence in praise of wolves. very well-ordained hierarchy within the pack. And certainly a pack, to my way of thinking, is, is actually akin to a human family. It, this, you've got father, mother, and uncles and aunts and offspring. Having researched wolves in the wild since 1955, and having written two books on wolves, I decided that uh, what I should do is to write a more general book and particularly to compare wild wolves with, with captive wolves. I had already visited a number of captive locations and found them uh, very negative. And so I had, I had some trouble with this and I was hoping to find a pack that was kept in good conditions. And then I heard about Jim Whipper who ran an operation up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And I was delighted with what I saw immediately. The wolf pack was in a two-acre enclosure, well wooded. They had uh, rocks that they could climb on, and wolves loved that kind of habitat. Uh, they, they could romp. They were fed um, wild meat from uh, deer killed on the highway. Um, they, were, they were as close to being a wild pack as you could get in a captive situation. When R.D. Ron Lawrence first encountered Jim Whipper's wolf pack, Shawano and Bridget were six years old. But Whipper's involvement with captive wolves had begun seven years earlier with his first wolf, a free-spirited female he called Sitka, whom he often filmed outside her small enclosure. As Jim tells us... Sitka was an interesting wolf. We'd take her for little parades, little walks in the woods, and we had a real good time with her. When she was a year old, Sitka looked like a wild wolf. She was not a pet, Jim says. No wolf makes a good pet. But she had developed a social relationship with Jim and his family, even with his dog. But there were no other wolves in her life. Getting her back into the enclosure was sometimes difficult. Um, I would coax her into a situation and make it look like, uh, well, there's nothing to fear, Sitka. We're just out here having a good time. And she would come up close to me, and then I would pounce on her and pick her up and carry her back home to the enclosure. Unfortunately, one day Sitka escaped and was shot by a neighbor. Jim realized that a larger enclosure and a pair of wolves, a male and a female, were necessary if captive wolves were to be motivated to remain within a fenced habitat. That spring, he bought two pups, bottle-fed and socialized them before placing them in a shallow den in an enclosure. He named them Shawano and Bridget. They imprinted on him as if he was one of their parents. The pups developed quickly, and by their first winter accepted the fence as nothing more than a limit of their natural territory. They romped and played together, displaying considerable affection for each other, but too young to mate. Another year would pass before they would be sexually mature. These early film sequences were invaluable to Ron Lawrence's project. The uniqueness of each wolf confirmed his belief that although wolves may display typical behavior patterns, each animal is one of a kind. The thing that I find most intriguing about nature is that there is no duplication. Every living thing, be it a, a human being or a mouse or a wolf or an elephant or a tree or even a tree leaf is unique.
time passed, and it was the following winter. The alpha male Shawano and the darker alpha female Bridget were almost two years old. Jim Whipper was surprised to observe obvious affection and playfulness between the bonded pair, but little in the way of heavy courtship and no signs of actual mating. Mating is not that much of a problem in captivity, provided that all the prerequisites to a happy existence are met for the wolves. By April, Jim observed a thickening around Bridget's waist and stomach. She was probably pregnant. Also, he noticed that the pair had built a new den. Early in May, he crawled in to investigate. Bridget had given birth to two black female pups. Wolf mothers are usually caring, loving, and patient parents. Bridget was no exception. Motherhood made her confident, even assertive. She barely tolerated Jim's presence in the den. The pups were given the names Denali and Siskiwit. They were little charmers, but with their flat, round faces, they looked more like little bear cubs than wolves. For a closer examination, Jim brought the larger pup into the daylight, the one he called Denali, the younger female, who would grow into a strong, aggressive adult wolf and eventually replace her mother, Bridget, as the alpha female of the pack, an aspect of the story that would fascinate Ron Lawrence. Jim had already decided not to remove the pups, not to bottle feed or try to socialize them, but to let them develop in as wild and natural a way as possible. Neither wolf ever did imprint on Jim or regard him as a member of the pack. Bridget was filmed bringing the pups out of the den. Denali first, followed by the smaller, more passive, Siskiwit. With their mother as their teacher, they set out to discover their territory. During the third winter, Bridget showed obvious concerns about her status as alpha female. As the breeding season approached, she began to view her year-old daughters as rivals especially Denali. Despite the fact that neither Denali nor Siskiwit were mature enough to mate, Bridget appeared highly stressed. Shawano demonstrated affection for his mate, supporting Bridget in her efforts to maintain her breeding status, often joining her in ritually rejecting or harassing their daughters. They start going through the breeding rituals about January. The behavior becomes much more complex about the middle of February and towards the end of February when they actually have roughly a week where the female is receptive for mating. Shawano continued to pursue Bridget, but the third winter Bridget was probably too stressed to mate and conceive. There was no litter that spring, no new additions to the pack. For years, stress in animals and humans had been a subject for Ron Lawrence's observation and research. He had a strong dislike of anthropomorphism, but was convinced that wolves have emotions, can think and feel, and make decisions, and that pack relationships are ritualistic, individual, and highly complex. One has to study wolves for many years, and many numbers of wolves, to understand that not all wolves behave in the same way. This is one of the problems that behaviorists uh, have. They see an animal doing a particular thing, 
and they immediately deduce that every animal of the same species is, is going to duplicate that action, and this is not so. During the breeding season of the fourth winter, Denali replaced her mother as alpha female of the pack, challenging and ritually dominating Bridget. Shawano had a new mate, his own daughter. His other daughter, Siskiwit, also two years old and a mature female, was subordinate to Denali in every way and no competition for the new alpha female. Denali, the wildest of the wolves, would not allow Jim or any other human to touch her. Bridget, her tail wagging, still tried to run and play with the pack. In the wilds, a displaced alpha female like Bridget would probably leave the pack, possibly mate with another lone wolf, or follow the pack at a distance, returning later to take over nursemaid duties when the new litter arrives. In Jim Whipper's enclosure, there was nowhere for Bridget to go. Denali continued to ritually dominate her, sitting on her, holding her down in the deep snow. That winter, Shawano and Denali would mate, and in spring, dig a deeper den to shelter their litter of four pups. Bridget patrolled the entrance, apparently as excited as the parents, but it would be a sad time for the wolves. Only one pup, Thor, a male, would survive the deadly parvovirus disease. Jim would take Thor from the den, bottle feed and socialize him for several weeks, probably saving his life. The wolf pack became stressed, feeling the tragedy. Getting on with their lives, the whole pack hung around the den as if expecting Thor to suddenly appear. Jim thinks they sensed Thor was inside the house and soon would be back with them. The Discovery Channel will return to In Praise of Wolves. Every day we exist not knowing, not caring, but we are part of nature's cycle linked forever to life force. Tuesday at 10 Eastern and Pacific, only on the Discovery Channel. What do all these police officers have in common? My name is Patrolman James New, and I was shot, shot once Bob Parcell, and I was shot right above the Every park. year, more police officers are shot. Point blank range. Yet fewer die, thanks to an innovative DuPont fiber called Kevlar caliber. in bullet-resistant vests. Tina Dillard, and I was shot twice at close range. Being a police officer is always going to be dangerous, but it doesn't have to be fatal. DuPont, better things for better living. This is $20,000. This is also $20,000. You'd take care of this, wouldn't you? You should take care of your car just as carefully, which is why you should bring your car to Jiffy Lube and ask for Pennzoil. Your car is worth thousands of dollars. Give it the quality of Pennzoil and the experience of Jiffy Lube. We have experience at Jiffy Lube. Jiffy Lube, America's favorite oil change. It was Memorial Day. I'm barbecuing for 30. I got the best chicken, I got the best steaks, I got the cheap charcoal, and I got burned. Fire's out. Totally. When do we eat? Sorry. Go out. So don't get burned by cheap charcoal. By the best. Kingsford charcoal. Fights faster, cooks longer. Kingsford. The sure fight. Saturday night at 10, surviving a Formula One boat crash and staying a champion. Daredevils, risk takers, thrill seekers, life on the extreme edge. Join me, Doug McConnell, this Saturday night at 10 for the Adventurers, only on the Discovery Channel. And watch for details on how to enter the Discovery Channel and MCI's Big Adventure Sweepstakes. OK, 
okay, so it's Thursday night, and I'm wondering what to watch. And then it hits me. Safari, Portrait of a People, and Discoveries Underwater. Thursday nights, beginning at 8 Eastern and Pacific, only on the Discovery Channel. Want to smile? Get HBO and Cinemax at special savings. And get a free Fuji Quick Snap camera. Get HBO for original series that redefine TV, street smart comedy, and big screen blockbusters. Get Cinemax, the best movie network on cable, and get a summer of a thousand and one movies. Subscribe now. Get HBO and Cinemax. And get a free Fuji Quick Snap camera with free developing. Cooking on QVC is uh, wonderful for meeting the people that I've always watched on QVC. A frugal Gourmet or Paul Prudhomme. Guests like that, stellar chefs from around the world, are regular guests here on cook shows at QVC. You're not only going to learn the recipe, but you're going to be able to learn to cook it as fast as today's lifestyles demand. The Discovery Channel now returns to In Praise of Wolves. Of all the winters, the fifth winter is the one Jim Whipper likes to remember. That pack, he says, really loved one another. Thor, the youngest, had developed into a magnificent young wolf. It seemed almost inevitable that one day he would challenge his father, Shawano, for leadership of the pack. Bridget had survived the harassment and was more confident Winter, of course, was their favorite time of the year. The female in charge was Denali. She communicated this with her purposeful stride, head up, tail high, compared to Bridget's submissive lower head and tail. Denali even seemed to yawn with relaxed confidence. These film sequences of the pack that winter show three black females and two lighter males. However, Siskiwit, Denali's sister, would become ill and die that year. Meanwhile, the pack that really loved one another romped and played in the deep winter snow, according to the rules of their ritual games. I slept with wild wolves. I watched them at their dens. I've never been threatened by a wolf beyond some howl barking when I moved position to observe the, the young a little better. I've been bitten many times by accident in, in handling animals and rehabilitating them, sick animals, injured animals, and so on. But uh, I've never been threatened by a wild animal. Uh, we're spending a great deal of money and time in studying the, the social behavior of, of, the, of the primates, uh, particularly the, the great apes, on the, on the premise that they're the most like us of all species. But in terms of, of social behavior, they're totally unlike us. The wolf is much closer. The major difference today between humans and our wild kin is that we have lost the habit of being in tune with the now of every moment and with all things, all influences that surround us. In late February, Shawano and Denali showed signs of preparing to mate. their tails high, pointing to the side, they circled each other affectionately. Thor, although sexually immature, was a passive observer. In May, Jim took a camera and lights into the underground wolf den. He placed the camera on a boat or sled, which he then pushed in front of him. As he crawled forward in the confined space with little or no room to turn around, the tunnel seemed to go on forever.
10 meters or 30 feet in, he still had not reached the end of the tunnel. Finally, he could see the litter. The pups only a few days old, eyes shut, huddled together. returned to see how the litter was progressing. Their eyes would now be open, and they would be on their feet, tottering around. First to greet him was a young male, who he would call Toivo, and behind Toivo, what looked like another male. There was no sign of the other three pups. He vacated the den as quickly as possible, crawling backwards until he was able to turn around near the entrance. Denali's second litter, once again, only one pup would survive. That was Toivo, who would replace Siskiwit, keeping the pack number at five. This would be the same pack Ron Lawrence would observe on his first meeting with Jim Whipper. The sixth winter, and we are back at the beginning of our story to the time when author naturalist R.D. Lawrence first arrived with his wife Sharon at Jim Whipper's Wolf Sanctuary near Ishpeming in Upper Michigan to begin work on his book In Praise of Wolves and found the habitat was a true wilderness setting, the wolf pack strong and healthy and well cared for. The leader of the pack, the alpha male, was still Shawano, now six years old, I got along very well with Shano. Thor was a bit standoffish. Thor is the wolf closest to the camera. Bridget is a very friendly wolf. She, she loves people. But what immediately caught Ron's attention was that it was well into the breeding season and Shawano, Denali, and the rest of the pack were harassing Bridget. It looked like more than just ritual play. There was evidence of minor injuries. He had not observed this behavior in the wilds. It seemed to be a direct result of her captive situation. He was concerned about her future. He was a scruffy looking guy, but he has a lot of personality. To the Lawrences, Toivo was a Dennis the Menace type of wolf, a natural comic, a bit of a clown and a trickster, always up to something, fun to observe. Wolves uh, amuse me sometimes and, and cause me to reflect on Victorian etiquette in their behavior. Uh, they they uh, can be quite sardonic and very polite. Their social interactions sometimes remind me of a dowager tea party in Victorian London where you, the ladies are, or, and gentlemen are sipping tea and uh, there's very polite conversation going on and nobody's really saying what they think. Wolves can do this, but, but then suddenly one of them will burst off into, into a prank. Of, and then, of course, they are no longer Victorian. Victorian. Loyal, disciplined, playful, highly efficient, family-oriented. A whole new way of looking at the wolf. The real wolf behind the mask of myth and legend. Is the cunning evil killer, the big bad wolf, purely imaginary? A result of our fear of the wild and the unknown? 
Is the wolf a part of our heritage? Were man the hunter's first social groups based on the observation and imitation of wolf packs and their kind? The Discovery Channel will return to In Praise of Wolves. Hello from Snapple. Today's letter is from Nancy Lambert. Her dog Shane can be asleep in the back bedroom, but if you open a Snapple, she comes running. This, I gotta see. Shaney, would you like some Snapple? Mmm, Shane, look at Snapple. You decided you want to sleep while everybody's watching you. What's Daddy drinking? Mmm, mm, oh, that good. Mm. What is it? See, I love Snapple. Come mm. on. Pink lemonade, made from the best stuff on earth. Forget it. This portion of Discovery is brought to you in part by Snapple Natural Beverages. There are some things that money can't buy. Infinity believes safety should be one of those things. That's why they're the only car company whose entire line includes standard, not only ABS and dual airbags, but automatic seatbelt pretensioners to help snug the belt around you as the airbags deploy. From their least expensive G20, to the most luxurious Q45. Would a visit to your Infinity showroom be in order? I think that's safe to say. everywhere. It's just plain soap until it chemically reacts with water and dries to a dull waxy film that clings to every bathroom surface. It's soap scum and it's very hard to get rid of. <laughs> or was introducing new Tylex soap scum remover. It's formulated specifically to dissolve soap scum on contact. Just spray it on and wipe it off to get your whole bathroom scum free. New Tylex Soap Scum Remover. The sure way to wipe out soap scum. There are some things that money can't buy. Infinity believes safety should be one of those things. That's why they're the only car company whose entire line includes standard not only ABS and dual airbags, but automatic seatbelt pretensioners to help snug the belt around you as the airbags deploy. From their least expensive G20 to their most luxurious Q45. Would a visit to your Infinity showroom be in order? I think that's safe to say. Okay, so it's Thursday night and I'm wondering what to watch. And then it hits me. Three hours of dangerous, exotic excitement, beginning at 8 Eastern and Pacific. Only on Thursday nights. And only on the Discovery Channel. Sunday, July 4th. Warbirds, wild birds, and our national symbol. First, take a flying tour of the National Warplane Museum with the Wings of Eagles. Next, journey to its largest known gathering place and see Alaska's bald eagle. Then get a close-up look at the wild turkey on a Discovery Sunday, 4th of July. Sunday, beginning at 9 Eastern and Pacific. The Discovery Channel now returns to In Praise of Wolves. Two years pass. It is the ninth winter. The scene has changed to the outskirts of Nagani, only a few miles away. The new enclosure is larger and an even better natural habitat. There were no new additions to the pack. It was the same four wolves, Shawano, Denali, Thor, and Bridget. At first, they were not as easily recognizable. Their winter coats were much lighter. Shawano was almost pure white.
In dual ritual displays, Denali is seen dominating Bridget, while Shawano stands momentarily over a submissive Thor. But within a few minutes, the five-year-old Thor would challenge his father's ritual attacks, baring his teeth. With Thor under him, jammed against the fence, Shawano firmly establishes his leadership of the pack, although a small battle scar was visible under his right eye. Having met and overcome the challenge, Shawano lopes off in search of his mate, Denali. A brief check on a submissive Thor, and Shawano is ready for some serious courtship. He and Denali walk into the woods. Thor slinks off, his tail between his legs. Half an hour later, Thor was still resting and licking his wounds. His mouth had been injured. Shawano had bitten down on the inside of the mouth and ripped out a few teeth. An extreme form of behavior. Possibly, once again, the result of the captive situation. In the wilds, a dominated mature wolf might have left the pack before this violent confrontation. But Thor had nowhere to go. Meanwhile, Shawano and Denali continued their courtship walk. Yawn, we're told, does not suggest Denali is bored. It is more likely a sign of pleasure, a relaxed attitude. However, Shawano is looking for a different message that she's ready to mate. Two years pass. We pick up our story in spring of the 11th year. Denali had died unexpectedly of pneumonia. Thor, now seven years old, has mated with a new two-year-old female, his sister Kenai. His father Shawano is still leader of the pack and dominates Thor. An uncommon situation in the wilds, but one Thor accepts, seemingly content to be the only breeding male. But Jim Whipper finds Shawano more remote, less approachable than in other years. This is Kenai, dark, like her mother. No attempt has been made to socialize her. She is about as wild as a wolf can get in captivity. Kenai has given birth to her first litter, four pups. Seen here in their den when only a few days old, the third generation of our wolf family. Bridget, now 11 years old, is not only still around, but has an important role to play as nursemaid to the new litter. Protective, attentive, caring, she seems to remind everyone of their favorite aunt or grandmother. Every member of the pack has a responsibility and a duty, and they exercise it. It's not all that rare for another female in the pack to lactate as if pregnant and be able to provide milk and nourishment to someone else's litter. About a week later, the pup's eyes are open, and they're feeding and tumbling about, watched over by the loving and infinitely patient Bridget.
Jim Whipper has every reason to feel satisfied with the manner in which he has raised his captive wolves. Just as important, Jim says, they have made his own life that much richer. My wolves in captivity have had an extremely good life, uh, certainly much better than they would have at uh, most zoos around the country. Uh, and I think because of that, because of the territory that they've had and, and the, the food that I've given them over the years and, and the fact that I've allowed them to be as much uh, wolf as I possibly could given their captive environment, they've given me then a glimpse of their life that most people uh, would never see. And I've done this for so long that I can't imagine uh, what it would be like to be without the wolves. Within a few weeks, the pups are observed walking around outside on a mound made up of sand from den tunneling. Ron Lawrence calls this kind of wobbly, unsteady walk, tottering. And as summer approaches, the woods are full of bothersome mosquitoes and other flying insects. To a careful observer, it appears that even during play, pack positions or hierarchy are being established among the pups. Some are just stronger and more aggressive than others. Shawana was seen among the pups. Also bothered by mosquitoes, he scratches an itch. When Shawana moves away, a pup wanders off to do a little exploring on its own. Even within the enclosure, it's not difficult for a pup to get lost. Once again, Bridget comes to the rescue. A year after meeting Jim Whipper and beginning to observe his wolf pack, Ron and Sharon Lawrence took advantage of an opportunity to raise their own captive wolves in a large enclosure in their 100-acre property in the Halliburton Highlands of Ontario. Seen here at six years of age are Tyga, a light brown female, and Tundra, a black male. The Lawrences had been given the wolves in the Yukon when the pups were about three weeks old, brought them back to Ontario in a station wagon and into their home, where at first they were bottle-fed every four hours. Day by day they became more curious, confident, playful and affectionate. At about four months, Tundra and Tyga were ready to live on their own inside the enclosure. Ron became aware of a fascinating situation. His wolves seemed to regard him as the alpha wolf, leader of the pack, something he had not experienced with Jim Whipper and his wolves. Ron describes Tundra, the dark male, as calm, thoughtful, easygoing, with a sense of humor. While Tyga, the lighter-haired female is said to be quick, playful, mischievous, easily excited, but sometimes needs discipline. In these scenes, the wolves are three to four years old. People ask me how I discipline Tundra and Tiger, and the answer is I don't. If they're doing things that wolves do, I stand back and say nothing. Occasionally, I have to, to become the parent wolf, and then I do it either by voice control or even by staring. Sometimes it requires both. They read your body language and they pick up immediately the scent of adrenaline. Those two things, things tell them that you're mad at them and right away they settle down. But you've got to mean it. You've got to force yourself into a sense of aggression even though you don't feel it. But I have never had to, I never would 
think of slapping them or hitting them or doing anything physical to them in that sense. The Lawrence wolves are more socialized than Jim Whipper's wolves. Tundra and taiga are fed daily, not roadkills, but foods similar to what the Lawrences eat. Ron and Sharon are in contact with them every day, usually inside the enclosure. People come to visit, and the wolves have acted strangely on only three or four occasions and always with highly stressed individuals. This social aspect of their personalities has one very important benefit. Jim Whipper's alpha female, Denali, died when she would not allow anyone to give her necessary medication. Since their earliest months, Tundra and Tyga have allowed the Lawrences and local veterinarian Lori Brown to examine, vaccinate, care for, and look after their health needs. The Discovery Channel will return to In Praise of Wolves. Shark Week 93, coming in July. Can you shout out tough grass stains? Sure. After three tries. Then try Stain Out, a new technology from Clorox. Stain Out attacks and breaks up stains others leave behind. Clorox Stain Out. Once in, stains are out. A bravely smile, a warm hello, an extra hand when you're on the go. There's something special in the air. Whether you're flying on business or pleasure, one airline makes you feel like you're something special. American Airlines, taking you to more places around the world than any other airline. With over 100,000 employees who believe you can mix business with pleasure. It's a pleasure doing business with you. Party's over, and nothing's gonna spoil these leftovers, because I use Ziploc brand storage bags. Only Ziploc has the gripper zipper. Tough, tiny teeth that lock freshness in. I wish I felt this fresh. Ziploc has the lock on freshness. Every day we exist, not knowing, not caring. Free, or so we think. But like everything on Earth, we are part of the cycle. Each player depending on the other. Each part essential, necessary, for energy, for fuel, for life. See where we fit in. Unlock the secrets of life force. Tuesday at 10 Eastern and Pacific, only on the Discovery Channel. Which publication tells you about hundreds of great jobs open across the country right now? High-paying, professional, managerial, and technical jobs. The National Business Employment Weekly. Which publication helps you land one of those jobs? With articles on how to sharpen your resume, how to shine in interviews, how to market yourself. The National Business Employment Weekly. Which publication helps you do better after you land a great job? Get along with your boss, get a raise, get promoted. The National Business Employment Weekly, published by the Wall Street Journal. It's all you need besides your own ability to land and do well in the kind of job you've been looking for in a part of the country you'll enjoy at a salary you can be proud of. It's all you need. Get the National Business Employment Weekly at your newsstand or order by credit card and get eight issues by first-class mail for $35. Call 800-334-6700. 800-334-6700. The National Business Employment Weekly. Don't make a career move without it. The Discovery Channel now returns to In Praise of Wolves. Possibly the most unnatural part of their lives as captive wolves is that they have little, if any, chance to exercise and develop hunting skills. A small mammal or bird, a grouse, rabbit, or skunk may venture inside the enclosure, but rarely. However, they do possess other survival skills. If Ron feeds them too much chicken when they're not hungry, they may hide it. Tundra demonstrates. <coughs> the 
The wolf, Ron believes, does not know fear as we experience it, as anxiety over future possibilities. Instead, it is an observant, cautious animal with incredible coordinated senses who lives one day at a time. There are so many ideas, so much first-hand experience to share whenever Jim Whipper visits Ron Lawrence in Halliburton. In the woods beyond the house, they discover fresh wild wolf tracks. There has been other evidence over the years, night howls and even a few sightings. By measuring the stride, they can estimate the size of the wolf. Ron tells Jim about a face-to-face -face encounter with a friendly visitor. I was being overlooked and he stood there and when I looked up, I said, oh, hello. Yeah. And he just wagged his tail. And he turned around and looked back, wagged his tail again, and then he trod off in the bush. The behaviorists uh, really bother me. They contend that animals are unable to think and are unable to make uh, their own decisions. Wolves use all their faculties, all their senses, very fine senses. When I leave the house or I come out of the bush, they know from my walk who I am. If they can't see, despite the fact that they can smell me and hear me, they, they don't trust me. Only when I come out and they say, oh yes, it's him. Every signal has got to meet in the animal's mind. To look at Extrasensory perception and transmission. Communication on a higher level or frequency. Ron feels that wolves may have all or many of these mysterious capabilities. They have uh, uh, an intense degree of sensitivity and, the, and, uh, and an uncanny ability to pick up influences that are beyond our reach. Now, in, in uh, strict terms, this is, for us anyway, extrasensory perception. Uh, I have had experiences in, in the wild and certainly with my wife and I, Sharon and I have had many experiences here uh, that prove to us, to our satisfaction, without uh, our being able to document them in a solid scientific way, that Tanda and Tiger are tuned into our moods. Now we feed them at different times every day. And as soon as I said, shall we feed them, we'd go and look out the window and they'd be there at the gate staring at the house and they're staring in an expectant way. Ears up, uh, we, we know their body language. So they have, the old word is telepathy. I haven't the foggiest idea how it works, but they have it. It is very much like having an extended family. They eat pretty well what we eat, but it means extra shopping, extra planning. They've been so much a part of our life since we have been here. I just can't think of a day without them. When I go in the enclosure, uh, they don't respect me quite as much as Ron. They love to jump all over me, lick my face. Um, it's sort of hard to put my place in the pack, but um, I'm more like a brother or sister to them, I think, um, than maybe their mother. For Sharon, a teacher, artist, and craftsperson, there was another unexpected advantage to caring for captive wolves. After uh, Tundra and Tiger's first molt, and I realized that I was getting these great big balls of under fur, and so it was suggested to me that I learn to spin and to weave, which I did. It's a little bit like Angora to feel, although with the number of guard hairs that you just can't get out, it's a little more like mohair in texture but it does make a beautiful garment. Just one of the many gifts the Lawrences received from their magnificent wolves, Tiger and Tundra. It was the 13th winter for Jim Whipper and his captive wolf pack. Light-haired Shawano, although no longer a breeding wolf, has managed to retain his rank as Alpha Wolf, leader of the pack, still treated with respect by the younger wolves. <coughs> Thor and Keen Eye are still around, and there were three healthy two-year-olds, two darker females and one lighter male, six wolves in all. It was the largest adult pack in 13 years. 
But what had happened to gentle, affectionate Bridget? She lived separately in her own enclosure for her own safety and well-being. Older and slower now, she's the same old Bridget, welcoming Jim enthusiastically on every visit. In the wilds, Bridget probably would not have lived to this age, never been an alpha female, mated or produced a litter. Despite harassment, it had been a long, useful life in captivity. Jim thinks, like Shawano, she might even live another two or three years. Interesting to observe, even though she doesn't live with them, Bridget remains psychologically a member of the pack, displaying submissive body language, even waiting for a cue from Shawano and the others to join in the howling. Howling is the way wolves communicate vocally, and it is a complex language. before they set out on a hunt, or just to say, hello out there, I'm in the neighborhood. Ravens are daring, highly intelligent birds. Wolves and ravens have some kind of ancient agreement or bond between them. Native people have often used them as spirit totems. You know, ravens certainly take pleasure in being around wolves. When I feed the wolves, uh, it's just a matter of minutes uh, that the ravens show up and, and they're right there waiting to converge on the carcass after the wolves have fed. Only a young, playful wolf would waste energy chasing ravens. Jim Whipper sums up his experience. The rewards um, are many with, with wolves. You get a glimpse of an animal that, uh, to me, is the total essence of the wilderness, particularly here in the north, um, that's been the strongest drive for me to maintain the pack for as long as I've had them. When I look out my back window and I see the pack engaged in whatever kind of behavior, it seems like it's it's so uh, refreshing to see so much exuberance and, and, uh, and joy for living as the wolves seem to uh, uh, express almost on a daily basis uh, to me. It doesn't matter really uh, what time of the year it is. They just really enjoy life. The wolves do not fight wars. Wolves do not hate. Humans hate. Wolves do not. Wolves do not seek revenge. Humans do. Wolves do not. Wolves do not resent people on our, or each other on a, on a long-term basis. Many people who have come here are fearful uh, with, an, with their own ideas of how the wolf would look and behave have certainly gone away with a totally different impression. Uh, I get very vexed when I hear somebody say, well, he's an animal. You are an animal, sir. So we are all animals. We're animated. We have life. So only for one reason, that is because it needs to eat. 
The wolf is the most social of all mammals. Yeah, I guess they are the most like us of all species. The observations, thoughts, and words of Canadian author naturalist R.D. Lawrence from his book, In Praise of Wolves. Tomorrow at 9, from imagination to reality, meet the man who dreamt up the helicopter on invention. Then imagine television of the future with high-definition TV and optical fiber networks on Next Step. everywhere. It's just plain soap until it chemically reacts with water and dries to a dull waxy film that clings to every bathroom surface. It's soap scum and it's very hard to get rid of. <laughs> or was introducing new Tylex soap scum remover. It's formulated specifically to dissolve soap scum on contact. Just spray it on and wipe it off to get your whole bathroom scum free. New Tylex Soap Scum Remover, the sure way to wipe out soap scum. Maybe you never thought of an airbag being custom made for a minivan. But that's how we build the Mazda MPV. Because we just thought making safety customary might appeal to you. Safari Back to the Stone Age, Tuesday on Terra X. Who was our greatest president? Some say it was Abraham Lincoln. But what about George Washington or Franklin Roosevelt? Certainly it wasn't Millard Fillmore or Warren G. Harding. There's no debating that each administration, for better or worse, has helped to shape America. Now, in celebration of our nation's birth, we'll recall the triumphs, the tragedies, the setbacks, and the scandals on Portraits of American Presidents, a six-hour special. Friday, beginning at 9, on The Learning Channel. In the last 18 hours, you've seen and done more than most people would in a lifetime. You've experienced the glory of nature and the beauty of our planet. You've witnessed man's quest for adventure and our hunger for achievement. You've traveled to the far corners of the globe and beyond. Tomorrow morning, we'll be back, and it all begins again. There's so much to see and so much to learn. We'll open your eyes to the world on the Discovery Channel.